This is a primer on decoding and representational similarity analysis with EG and MEG. Um, I'm not going to go into very much detail with respect to the uh, actually methods behind all this. And more, uh, I mean, decoding and, and RSA are applied in different imaging modalities. And um, so I'm not going to explain the uh, methodological basis of these methods that are common with other imaging modalities. So I'm focusing more on the way these methods are applied to EEG and MEG data and what you can do with them. But I think there are some really good tutorials around that uh, will also that I will also mention in in this presentation. So let's start with a little bit of some of the basics at least. Um, so decoding methods. Um, I think these days they are mostly coding mostly called decoding methods, but um, they used to be called multi-voxel pattern analysis uh, methods, for example. Um, approach data in slightly different ways than the ones that we've dealt with in the previous uh, sessions. So previously, we usually uh, described our analyses as a sensor by sensor or vertex by vertex uh, method. So we didn't really care about the combination of sensors or vertices, and this is different now for decoding. So now we are taking uh, patterns of activation either across sensors and sensor space or for regions of interest or in principle across, we could do that across the whole brain. Uh, and we look how they are related across trials between different stimuli and so on and so forth. So let's assume that there's a simple experiment. Your participant sees uh, blue circles and these, well, whatever this color this is, orangey brownish um, uh, squares. And uh, for every stimulus, you can get the pattern across a certain number of vertices, let's say here in the anterior temporal lobe, because here the, the pointer points towards that. And if in this case you assume you, you have um, only two channels, then you can plot every measurement for these two channels uh, together in this display here. So every square produces a certain combination of values. You can put that here into this coordinate system. Every circle produces another pattern here. Um, and if you're lucky, then there's maybe some systematic relationship that pops out here. Maybe all the um, all the circles on one side on all the um, uh, squares are on another side, for example. So might, there might be something in the combination of these values that wouldn't be obvious if you just look at channel one or channel two individually. Um, and this is what you can do with these classifier methods. You find some line, so this is here the case for these two channels, that distinguishes one class of stimuli or the patterns of one class of stimuli from another as good as as good as you can. Um, so you, you can um, do that on one subset of your data in order to avoid overfitting and then test on another set of your data. So you find the best fitting, you take a subset of your data, you find a line that distinguishes your stimuli uh, as good as, as you can with just one line. In principle, you could have something more complex than a line, but some model, let's say. But most of the time, we, when we are talking about decoding, we are talking about these linear classifiers here, a line that separates these classes. And then you test them on a previously unused part of your data um, to see if it's actually generalizing to un unseen data to avoid overfitting. Uh, and in this case, with only a few data points, but just for illustration, you can see that you, are, you seem to be above chance, so there are more squares on this side and on that side, but you do make some error. Uh, so you can get an accuracy, you can get an error rate. There are different ways of measuring that. Um, and this error rate cluster uh, classifier accuracy, you can then plot over time. So you can do this whole procedure uh, for every time point in your data. I mean, again, either for an RI over time, whole brain over time. So you could have several of these lines here for different regions of interest. You can plot the classifier accuracy, and you might see that in the baseline, you're around chance. So this here is 50%, sorry if you can't see that. Uh, and then at some point, you can check whether this declassifier accuracy is above chance, significantly above chance uh, across participants, for example. You can do that for different regions, uh, and you can classify different things. I mean, like, like the color or the, um, the shape of these objects or whatever you have. Obviously, you have to make sure that maybe these, these things are not confounded with each other. And well, then you can do lots of interesting analyses with that. And here in this simulated example, um, they in this tutorial, which is really nice uh, for EEG and MEG analysis, 
uh, that will demonstrate the strength of this approach because there might be information in the combination of channels that is not there in individual channels. So in the simulated data, the blue line is just slightly above the other line here and below the other line in channel two. And you might look at this and think, well, there's probably not really much there. Um, but if you actually look at this in this uh, pattern representation here, so plotting one channel, the amplitude of one channel over the other, then you actually see that these are almost perfectly separated, these groups, I mean, these, these categories here. So even these tiny differences, uh, if you look at them as patterns, might actually produce quite a reliable difference here. And with a simple classifier, you can almost at every trial uh, decide whether uh, one trial belonged to one category or another. There are different ways to use this decoding approach. And uh, with EEG MEG data, one also has the opportunity to look at decoding, uh, not just over time, but also to use what's called the temporal generalization method. So that is illustrated, uh, illustrated here. So imagine your participant just heard a simple sound or maybe different types of sounds that you want to categorize um, at time zero. And the back line, the black line here indicates um, the decoding performance of a classifier that is applied sample by sample, just as we did before. And note that across these different panels here, the black line is always the same, because if you do the sample by sample, well, you simply get uh, the same result in all of these panels. But what these different panels actually indicate is that what happens if you actually train your classifier at one latency, for example, 600 milliseconds, but then you still test it across the whole latency range. So is it actually a good predictor still at latencies where it actually wasn't trained on? You can see for latency of 600 milliseconds, the, this line is quite flat. Um, but if you go in an earlier latency range, three to 100 milliseconds, you can actually see that training your classified one latency still produces um, what looks like significant, or at least different from chance, decoding accuracy, even at latencies, you know, up to 100 milliseconds afterwards. So the information seems to stay in the data for a longer period of time. And that is uh, yeah, potentially interesting. So these, let's say, off-diagonal elements here, and this is something you can then plot in a matrix, temporal generalization matrix here. So you train on one latency, actually, sorry, this is here the training, yeah, the, here they, the, the, the roles are the training time, um, and then the columns of the generalization time. It also shows that, yes, it is centered, centered around the diagonal here, so significant decoding accuracy, but still there seem to be latency ranges where um, it, um, uh, yeah, the, the information stays, stays in the data for, slightly, uh, for an extended period of time. So there are some patterns in these data that you wouldn't necessarily see if you just look at evoke responses or just let, look at, uh, at the decoding, at the sample sample decoding over time. What it all means, I will leave you to find out uh, in the paper. Um, but at least that's something you can do. Uh, but there is, of course, the question, I mean, why can we decode something at all? I mean, there's already a long, well, there was already discussion about that in the fMRI literature, where it was actually you know, quite surprising to see that with these macroscopic data on the millimeter scale, you can decode things that we actually thought were coded more at the micro micrometer scale. So a much fine, at a much more fine-grained level that fMRI can resolve in space. Uh, that was at least in the pre, you know, ultra high resolution uh, fMRI age. But the um, idea there is that even if you have a microscopic pattern um, that you can't really see with your fMRI with the resolution of fMRI, uh, it still produces some variability at the macroscopic level that still produces these differences in patterns across, across voxels. So it just sort of, uh, you know, it trickles upwards, if you like, uh, into your macroscopic measurements. But with EEG and MEG, you may remember from our set previous sessions, especially on spatial resolution of, of EEG MEG source estimates, I mean, it's even more complicated because we have spatial resolution, not even at the millimeter scale, but maybe at the centimeter scale. So it's much more blurred than, than fMRI data, and yet, um, there are studies uh, that have clearly shown that you can decode even um, not just object categories, but uh, oh, yeah, I mean, mostly object categories, but also other stimulus parameters very reliably uh, from, from MEG data. So where does this information come from? Uh, and um, this paper by Stokes et al. suggested that it could also be the orientation of sources because in the in the MEG, here they put, put some examples, um, 
Yes, we have low spatial resolution, but if you happen to be uh, in the area of a gyrus or some or, yeah, fold, cortical, cortical fold, then just moving by a few millimeters might actually change the orientation of your source quite a bit. And that changes the topography also quite a bit. Just remember MEG magnetometers, right-hand rule. So with a dipole in one direction, you have circular magnetic fields. If you change the dipole orientation a little bit, it can actually have quite a dramatic effect on the magnetic field lines that you measure outside the head. So that might actually produce these uh, effects that you can then detect as patterns that help you classify different stimulus categories, even though the spatial resolution is in principle much lower than what's required to get to these macroscopic, macroscopic effects. Okay, I mean, I think that's actually good news. Um, there is one um, also a, a debate about how to uh, interpret the actual weight like this. So it's, it's nice that you have, um, I mean, if you can decode stimulus categories, I mean, whether it's triangles or circles from rectangles or living from non-living things or something even more interesting. I mean, that's of course up to you. But then you might be tempted to say, okay, once I have my, my classifiers, then of course I, look at, I can look at these weights and they will tell me which sensors or which vertices, which areas in the brain um, carry this information about my stimulus categories. But there is a little complication. It is, it is possible, but there's a complication there. So you cannot look at these weights directly. So you have something that's called, uh, or usually called back projection. And that is nicely described here in this, in this paper by Hauf et al. Uh, and the problem here is illustrated with a simple scenario. Let's assume you have an EEG recording uh, with only two, two electrodes here. Doesn't really matter what kind of stimuli that were presented, but let's say you just have two categories uh, uh, of stimuli. Um, and in this kind, in this um, hypothes hypothetical scenario, channel one shows very different amplitudes for for two different categories, so they overlap a little bit. But apparently, one category produces larger amplitudes than the other one. Uh, while the other channel, channel two, these distributions are completely overlapping. So you could say, well, it's actually only channel one that that is useful to distinguish categories one and two. So you would expect that your classifier has a number zero in this channel and a higher number, maybe even just uh, one uh, in, in, in the other channel. And if that was the case, then you could conclude, okay, channel, actually this is channel two here, channel two is useless and channel, only channel one is informative. So that would work. However, if, the, uh, if your data are correlated or if the, if the noise is correlated in your data, then this apparently useless channel two might still be useful. Uh, it might still subtract noise out of your data that will that may improve your, your decoding accuracy. So this is illustrated here with, with some of these color coding with these different, um, yeah, the, the different weights that are presented here. So long story short, I mean, if you actually use the decoder and you look at the weight, you will get something that actually includes both channels. So it would be one for channel one and the number two for channel two, suggesting that both channels carry information about the two stimulus categories. Um, however, um, if you actually do it right and you take the, the noise um, covariance, or, yeah, generally the covariance of your channels into account and you correct for that and you get to the real uh, activation patterns, um, then uh, you actually find out, then you will actually get the reliable result that only channel two carries this information. So long story short, if you're interested in uh, these weight vectors from your decoding, uh, if you want to interpret them in some way, then you need this kind of this spec projection method that uh, also looks uses the noise covariance uh, of your data. Uh, this also has implications for, uh, for example, if you want to perform source estimation. So you might say, okay, I can do my decoding in sensor space, EEG or MEG, uh, and then for my decoding weights, you know, I can localize them and see which brain areas contribute uh, the most which in principle is a good idea, except that you can't do it, um, you can't do it with the filter weights that directly come from your decoder. If you do that, you have something that doesn't, simply doesn't have the units of the right physical units, you know, microvolts or, or Tesla or whatever you have. So here they fit at a dipole. Um, I'm trying to remember now, is that actually simulate data? I think so. And you get some explained variance even below 50%. So it's, it's simply, well, I simply cross that out. So it simply doesn't make sense. Um, however, if you use the back projection method, you actually get activation patterns that are associated with your decoding model. 
you can't apply source estimation to that. And hey, presto, you have goodnesses of it close close to one. Um, so uh, if you want to do source estimation on your decoding uh, your decoding weights, then well, don't <laughs> use the back projected activation patterns. Um, it's also worth maybe just taking one step back. I think we also have to ask ourselves carefully, you know, what can we actually decode from and where can we decode from? Uh, we know that with EG and MEG, you have certain localization biases, limited spatial resolution, and it differs across the cortex and the brain. So depending on whether you're deep or not so deep or so on and so forth. Um, so just keep that in mind when you define regions of interest. So you have to make them big enough to actually have something like a pattern in your data. It's not easy to determine. Some areas have very good spatial resolution, tip of the occipital lobe, for example, um, but others, you know, in deeper areas, for example, like insula, you might have strong mislocalization in this area. Uh, you're simply not very sensitive to this area and other areas might completely overshadow this activation. I mean, just keep all these things in mind when you're designing your, your decoding analysis uh, in source space. Another important thing is, um, you know, what, what exactly to decode from. Uh, you may remember that with um, EEG MEG source estimates, you don't just get activation or intensity. I mean, like for example, with fMRI data, where you usually just have an activation value. So you actually have uh, a direction of current flow as well. So it depends a bit on how you set up your, your source base, um, whether you put, for example, had an orientation constraint on your dipoles, whether you allow them to have three directions or only, uh, or if you assume them to be uh, only perpendicular to the cortical surface. But even then, so even if you, if you restrict them to be perpendicular to the cortical surface, so only one dimensional, or maybe you use the loose orientation constraint where you assume them to be at least mostly perpendicular to the cortical surface. I mean, even then, um, your current still has a direction. So you have current that can flow, let's say, out of the cortex and into the cortic or into the cortical surface. Usually, if we do an evoked analysis, uh, if, you, if we're just interested in where is, in where is activation, does it differ between two conditions, we ignore that. We are just looking at intensity. Uh, and then we say, we compare condition A, condition B, and we say there's more in one region or, uh, or more in another region. However, for... Uh, decoding, we want to keep as much information as possible about whatever in our patterns might be different between conditions. It can only help you to um, distinguish between, between stimulus categories. So in that case, just don't use the intensity. Use the, originally, the original signed activation values. They have positive and negative values if you plot them. So that might actually help you with the decoding. So you're, you're just keeping information here that's, uh, that, is, that will get lost if you compute the intensity. It's also a question on, you know, how to actually set up your um, decoding approach. Uh, I mean, this is just from one of our recent studies here. So um, Federica, Federica Magna Bosco compared two approaches. She compared uh, decoding on a region of interest by region of interest basis. So she, she basically trained and tested decoders for uh, several um, several individual RIs. Um, and she compared that to an approach where she actually did the decoding across RIs and then used back projection um, to look at the weights or the activation patterns after back projection and then determine which regions of interest con contribute more or less um, to the decoding. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here. So this was a semantic, uh, semantic task or a study on, on uh, yeah, semantic uh, word processing. But we actually found that for some task related effects that are probably more distributed, uh, using the approach, um, using the combined RI approach. So I think I, I just illustrated it incorrectly. There are also different ways of applying um, decoding to source-based data. I mean, this is from a quite a recent study. I mean, from one of uh, uh, from our lab. 
So Federica, Federica Magna Bosco um, looked at two decoding approaches and one was for individual RIs. I mean, that's more or less the approach that I introduced before. So you take one RI and train and test the decoder for that RI, and then you do the same for other RIs, but these RIs don't really know from each other. But you can also combine all RIs into one decoding model and then back project the decoding weights. You get activation values. Um, and then you can look at these activation values and see which brain areas contributed more or less to your decoding weights. So if there's any information across RIs that's helpful in the decoding, you know, this might be potentially a better approach if you are really interested in whether individual RIs contain information about stimulus or task properties, and this might be the better approach. Uh, and long, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but we found that we do get different results for these two approaches. And it looks like if effects are distributed across RIs, like some, some maybe bigger effects of task differences, for example, then the combined RI approach seems to be more powerful and produce at least more plausible results. While if we have more focal effects, like for some stimulus features, in this case, uh, the you know, semantic category of words, then the individual RI approach seems to be uh, more, more powerful. So uh, there's simply no right or wrong, as usual. Um, it's, it's different strokes for different folks in this case. But uh, it is a choice that you, you have to make. I mean, this is the paper that I've just mentioned. I mean, there's also an fMRI paper from, from the well, field of fMRI analysis. Uh, so these guys, Cox and Rogers, actually looked at ways to decode information across the whole cortex and then decide based on the decoding weights, which brain areas contribute more or less. Um, so yeah, so this is certainly something that will still be uh, discussed in the future. Okay, now I would like to move on to another um, multi-voxel pattern method, and that's a representational similarity analysis. So this was introduced by, by Krieger's court, at least to the fMRI domain. It actually goes back to a paper in a journal of uh, philosophical psychology. So interestingly, it was more, let's say, I don't know, can you say cognitive philosophers uh, who are asking themselves, well, I mean, what is really a, a cognitive representation and how would that be reflected in imaging data? And they, they concluded that, well, we can't really look at these representations directly, but what we can look at as it, uh, what we can look at is a representational structure. So, um, well, I hope I can explain that in a, just in a, in a couple of minutes here. I actually have these slides already in my, my session on multimodal imaging, because it's also a way of combining data uh, across different imaging modalities and even computational models, but that's a separate aspect of this method. So what, um, what we do with these methods, we again look at patterns of activation within our eyes, also across sensors and sensor space. Uh, we get these patterns for every individual stimulus, so these are, for example, faces and objects here. I think in this particular study, there were 92, it doesn't matter, but there are simply many of them. And then you can create a matrix and um, in this, this matrix reflects the similarity of these patterns among all these stimuli. So this face with itself will obviously have a very high similarity. Um, and this phase with another phase might have slightly lower similarity, but this might still be higher than between the phase and, well, whatever this is, I can't even see it myself here. Let's see a face and a car uh, or a spider. So we'll have lower similarity. So if you plot these similarities based on the correlation of patterns or the decoding performance from one to the other, um, then yeah, you get the similarity matrix. And of course, to confuse us, they call it dissimilarity matrix. So it's called representational similarity analysis, but um, this matrix is called the similarity matrix. They should really get their story straight, but now we have to deal with this. Um, and the interesting thing is that you can get this, for example, for different regions of interest, and then you can check how these matrices differ across regions. You can also create these for different imaging modalities. Um, I mean, this illustrated here for example, for human MRI and for monkey fMRI for the same stimuli, uh, then for MEG um, or for single cell recordings or even from computational models. You know, what, what would your computational model predict? You know, how similar these, these stimuli are to each other or from ratings, you can ask people how, how, how related are these stimuli depending on you know, how familiar you are with them or 
certain features or how often you use them or how you use them. Anyway, um, your image, yeah, the, the sky is the limit here. Um, and then if you have all these similarity matrices from dissimilarity matrices for your different methods, for models, whatever you, you want, you can compare them with each other and see which ones, um, which ones fit, fit each other best and which don't. Now, for example, does monkey fMRI uh, resemble human fMRI in certain regions of interest in inferior temporal cortex, for example? Does some computational model predict our fMRI uh, the similarity matrices better than other computational models. And the same with MEG. So do the similarity matrices at different time points in different regions resemble the dissimilarity matrices of particular regions in the fMRI better than others? Um, yeah, so that's the game you can play. Of course, this game has been played. Um, quite a few studies have used this approach, but this was a seminal study by Kishi et al. It also uh, here explains the approach in a bit more detail. You can create this time-time MEG decoding matrix uh, for different stimulus features. You can then, for each of these pairs of uh, latencies, create a decoding matrix, which will serve as your similarity or dissimilarity matrix, 92 times 92 stimuli. So this was done in sensor space, so there are no regions of interest here. So you take all these all the sensors, but in principle, this could be done for different regions of interest as well. Uh, you can do the same then for the same stimuli with uh, human fMRI. You, here you can use different regions, and they focus on, uh, on V1 and inferior temporal cortex. Uh, and then you can compare those with each other. So you can check whether these matrices fit or don't fit very well in different latency or for different pairs of latencies here. So you can maybe use the correlation of matrices from here with those matrices and plot that as a time-time matrix here. Um, yeah, and then you can check whether the fMRI data, um, so you can basically combine the spatial resolution of fMRI with the temporal resolution of MEG and see uh, at, which, uh, at which time points in the MEG, you know, these two regions uh, predict the representational pattern best. And if you do that, you get something like this. So here is, it's the MEG and V1 comparison. And you see that there's this brief peak here in the, in the time time matrix around 100 milliseconds and seems to generalize a little bit here quite uh, along over time. And if you look at MEG and IT, the infratemporal cortex higher level visual processing area, you can see later effects that are also more extended in time. So that's already an interesting, interesting result. Uh, obviously you can then subtract them. You can compute statistics on them. I'm not, I don't want to go into much more detail right now, but at least um, this shows really what that you have a wealth of data now that can produce uh, also, also quite a wealth of interesting results. So here the fun only begins if you then look at different semantic categories or variables uh, and you look at these data in more detail. So this was really only the beginning. Uh, another study um, that by Kitzman et al. highlights that you can also do the same thing uh, by compar comparing uh, your representational dissimilarity matrices, in this case of EEG, MEG data in source space with computational models. But uh, you know, first of all, it shows that you can create these dissimilarity matrices across time for different regions. So here you source estimate your data, you define regions of interest, and you look at the similarity of these patterns here. Uh, and you can see some structure already emerging here. So early on, you see a little square here. These are probably faces in the data set. So they always pop out somehow. They are very very similar to each other, but dissimilar to other categories. And over time, you see that there are other squares appearing here. I don't remember exactly now what this is, but I mean, this is already fun fun to watch somehow, how different in different regions and over time, different stimulus features really emerge. And this, once you plot data in this kind of, in this way, so there clearly is information there that otherwise you wouldn't really have noticed. Uh, you can then summarize this um, as time courses here. Uh, you can also then already, you know, check how these these matrices uh, correlate with those, uh, for example, from some computational models or models of, of visual object processing, uh, or with different different semantic variables. But you can you can check how similar or dissimilar are different different stimuli like these images based on different semantic categories or visual categories. 
Um, so that's fun. Um, but importantly, once you have these time courses for whatever you, are, you want to do with your data, you can then also use them, for example, to look at well, connectivity between areas. So you, you have time courses for different areas and you can see if information in one area or an increase of information in one area predicts an increase or decrease of information in another area. Uh, you can, like in this study, apply Granger, Granger uh, analysis type methods, uh, which would then describe the information flow between areas, in this case, V1 to 3 to V4. Uh, and here, the, these arrows indeed represent the, the flow of information uh, from one area to another. So this would be, you know, the purple line here is the, the, the feed forward direction. The orangey line is the feed backward direction. Um, and this shows that you do get an initial peak here for the feed for, feed forward connection, but almost at the same time, it's a little bit later, a little bit delayed, you also get, get feedback, uh, feedback information here. Uh, and this is also done for another, for the next basically step in the processing hierarchy here. So this is actually very, really very powerful combination of methods here from the multi-voxel pattern information analysis to the RSA approach and then Granger causality to describe the information flow of, uh, with, with EEG MEG data. And then this is to illustrate that you can also compare this to um, deep neural networks. So now we've already looked at multiple latency ranges and multiple regions of interest, but now you can also look at these deep neural networks and look at multiple layers of these networks. You can also compare different types of networks and then see which one predicts your MEG data best or the similarity structure. Uh, well, this was done in this study. I don't necessarily want to go into very much detail, but uh, one result from this study, for example, was that when you compare deep neural networks that have recurrent connections and those that don't have recurrent connections and those that do have re recurrent connections win, so they produce representational similarity structures that are better suited to predict or uh, resemble those from the MEG data better than those that don't have these recurrent uh, connections. Okay, if you're interested in all of this, I mean, I, I'm not really up to date on what different software packages um, have to offer. I think all of them do RSA and uh, certainly decoding, but also RSA analysis one way or the other, but there is a dedicated Python toolbox here and I just checked and it was still updated a week ago. So I hope it's still active. It originated in the lab of, of Nico Krieger's quarter. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you want to get your hands on, on something, some real analysis, then might be that's at least a starting point. So thank you very much for now. <laughs>